today, and I'm sorry your pastor is not here, but if he was here, I couldn't be here, so I'm not too sorry, and, uh, but anyway, I appreciate the privilege and the opportunity of sharing with you this morning. This morning, I have my wife, Doris, uh, with me, and she's right here. Stand up, honey, so they'll know uh, who you are. She's, uh, uh, she's the Tennessee girl that um, Brother Duncan was speaking of. And it took me several years to get her to quit dipping snuff and put shoes on. But other than that, uh, I'll, I'll hear about that at lunch, believe me. But anyway, uh, uh, no, we met at college. And uh, she was a city girl. I was a country boy, not her. But uh, nonetheless, I, I'm glad she's able to be with me. She travels with me occasionally, sometimes, and when she can. And um, she has uh, uh, had some physical issues, but I'm glad she's able to be with us today. I, uh, I, I want to take just a moment. I'm going to be speaking from Luke chapter 2 on Simeon, as was previously announced, and um, a little different message. I, I took the liberty, since I was uh, invited to fill the pulpit this morning uh, for your pastor, I took the liberty uh, to do uh, what I was exhorted to do when I retired and began to travel and speak by a very godly man from Texas, and he he said to me, he said, now, when you go out and speak, he said, um, try to give the people you're speaking to new wine. And you say, I don't understand that. What he was saying was, don't preach the old sermons you have. Uh, ask the Lord to give you something fresh and new for the people that you're going to be speaking to. I, I was in evangelism for three years in between the pastorate when I left uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and before assuming another pastorate, and I, as I traveled around did, did, did uh, revivals, I was in the state of New Jersey, I remember it well, Clark, New Jersey, and uh, a gentleman came to me, and he said, so, you say you're an evangelist, are you? At that time, I was, I, built, I was built as an evangelist, doing evangelistic meetings, and I said, yes, sir. He said, well, so you got seven sermons, do you? And I said, well, I think I have more than that. He said, oh, he said, I know you evangelists. You got seven. You just preach them over and over and over and over. He said about seven, sir. And he kept on. And I know I'm a mild-mannered, uh, kind uh, individual, and, uh, but I do have a side of me. I, he finally got on my nerves. And I looked at him, and I said, hey, friend, let me ask you a question. Would you give me, give me 50 cents for every sermon over, over seven I have uh, that I can produce in uh, audio form? And he said, well, he said it wouldn't be much over seven. I don't think I said, no, just 2200 when, when can I pick up my check for $1,100? And uh, he walked off. I tell you that to illustrate, that, just to say, that after you've passed the preach as long as I have, yes, I have a repertoire of sermons. If you're not careful, you begin to just preach, you know, out of, the, out of what you had and study. But I'm not doing that this morning. I asked the Lord to give me something fresh and something new. And uh, I, it's a sermon I've never preached before, but it's a sermon that I hope will be a, be a challenge and a blessing to you as we be, think about going into this new year. You know, this is the last day of 2017. You say, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah, well, that means tomorrow's the first day of 2018. And tomorrow will be the first day of the rest of your life if you live through the day and the night. And, you know, when you start to stop thinking and start thinking about that, it's amazing how quickly the years have gone by. Speaking of uh, Brother Duncan, we were going back and rehearsing some uh, uh, memories from some people that we knew in the past, and Ralph Hedrick and some of the others. just seems like yesterday I was sitting in the happy corner uh, with all those guys having coffee and, and uh, listening to the theological debates. I told someone yesterday I learned more theology in the happy corner than I ever did. That was our, our uh, snack bar at Tennessee Temple than I ever did in a theology class, listening to, the, to debates and, and the discussions from those seminary students and college students in those days. But hey, it just seems like just a few days ago that we were there. Now all of a sudden here, it's 2017, I'm 39 plus, and uh, uh, a big plus, but anyway, uh, really I'm 71 years of, uh, years of age, and I had all these years of ministry, and find myself this morning here in Palm Harbor speaking to a bunch of wonderful people and sharing the gospel. But how quick the years get by? Let me just give you about a one-minute snapshot if you want to turn in your Bibles. We'll look together at uh, 
One passage that may be a little strange uh, in, for consideration is Genesis chapter 29, verse 33. And then we'll go to Luke chapter 2 and the Simeon that, uh, that we'll, we'll talk about this morning. But let me just give you a snapshot of what uh, I did so when I was here more in detail. I'm not going to go back and do all of that. But I, uh, I was saved in, uh, under the ministry of uh, Brother Lester Roloff. Uh, in a revival meeting at the Thomas Road Baptist Church back in 1965. Went to Tennessee Temple, graduated, started the church, met my wife there. Uh, God gave us two wonderful children. Uh, our son diagnosed with a brain tumor uh, at the age of six, seven years of age, and uh, was left mentally and physically handicapped. And we chose to keep him in our home. My wife went back to college and got her BSN so we could care for him in our home without having to put him in an institution. Because of his condition, he probably wouldn't have lived very long in an institution. They told us he'd live a year or two, and he wound up living 26 years and died in 2004 at the age of, of, um, of 31. Uh, when I retired, I started up my itinerant ministry, traveling, doing what I'm doing now. Uh, under a 501c3 that we established, uh, a ministry, uh, PRH Ministries. That was his initials, Paul Rudolph Holland. And uh, we continued doing that and, and, and traveling. I began to speak uh, an awful lot here in, in the state of Florida. And after moving here, I found out that uh, a, a, a friend of mine by the name of David Gibbs and actually David Gibbs III uh, was still in the area. I called him and we got together. He asked me if I would do some seminars with him for the organization that he has. His father, uh, David Gibbs Jr., was the founder of, of uh, Christian Law Association, which I was involved with. David Gibbs III is one year older than my daughter, so I've actually known him ever since he was a child. And uh, he has his own organization, National Center for Life and Liberty. And he said, would, you, would ask me would I do some seminars with him? And so I, I agreed to do so. And after much prayer and consideration, it was, that was during the week and didn't bother my itinerant ministry. And then after that, he asked me if I would become the pastoral face for National Center for Life and Liberty. And I agreed to do that. And, and um, I now travel doing what I've always done, what I'm doing this morning, and what I'm uh, preaching. But I also uh, like to present to churches and encourage churches that if they're if they're not involved in, in partnership with ministries like National Center for Life and Liberty, that, to, to please consider it. These are difficult days. Do you realize that? Times have changed. I was just watching on TV this morning that couple that had the bakery who lost uh, uh, the court decision. Uh, and they're going to have to pay 135000 because they wouldn't, they wouldn't do a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. Uh, those kind of issues are, are filtering now into the church. They, um, the LBGTQ uh, situation we're facing and all the problems. Uh, and then we have also just uh, the onslaught of bureaucracy. Some, someone said to me, he said, well, surely that's better now that we have a more conservative um, leadership in far as seemingly anyway uh, in, in, in the White House and so on. And I said, no, no. What that did was that drives the, the, the liberal uh, agenda and those that would quiet our voice and try to keep our, men, our message within four walls, if at all, it has driven them from the legislative uh, approach to changing things back to the bureaucracies and the, and the courts, and especially the courts. And I don't have time, but I have m many, many churches in, in the last nine months that uh, have contacted me and not, and not need, many of them not knowing I was even involved with National Center for Life, and they were saying, what can we do? who are being under attack. And it's a wonderful thing to have a qualified and very accomplished little team that are available to us for just, without having to pay those uh, unbelievable legal fees. And so uh, I, 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 I always emphasize that these are, day, these are different days and we must be diligent and be, and, and, and be ready to defend the faith and stand for that which God has given us to do as far as ministry. 
But with all that said, I still do all what I've always done, and that is just preach the Word of God uh, as God gives me opportunity. This is New Year's Eve. We're coming to the close of another year. Someone said many years ago in my hearing, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I thought that was a good saying, and I, I, I put it away to memory. However, sometime after that, I heard someone else who changed the wording a little bit and said it this way. God said it, that settles it, whether I or anybody else believes it. And that's so true, isn't it? God's promises are true. God's promises are sure. We can rest upon the promises of God in 2018, just as we have through the, through the, uh, the months and the days of 2017. I come, we come to, uh, to the book of Genesis in chapter number 29 and verse number 33. And uh, Jacob, as his second son, is being born to Leah. And as she, he, she gives birth, the Bible says, and she conceived again, this is his second son, and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son. And she called his name Simeon. I call your attention to the statement that she said, because the Lord hath heard. And God still hears our cries, don't he? He still hears us when we call out to him. His promises are still true. And when we claim those promises and rest upon those promises, they are true. The name Simeon is used in, in this occasion in Genesis. And, and then, of course, again in Luke chapter number 2 and and some other passages, you might find that name in some other uh, listing of the names of people in the Old Testament, the name Simeon. But I call your attention to the, the Simeon of, of Luke chapter number 2. And I want to read the verses, and then I want to rehearse the events and give you the background of the, of the text. And then I'm going to do something else. I'm going to, I'm going to develop the text briefly, not an exposition, but briefly develop the text, and then I'm going to give to you, give to us as we leave today, a picture of some things that we can learn from the text that will encourage us maybe for the coming year, and maybe even for the remainder of 2017. You remember that in verse number, verse number 21, we we have the occasion. Jesus has been born in Bethlehem, and. Uh, uh, it's an interesting thing. He was born in a manger, and then we, 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 we depict him as staying in the manger, but not so, because he was moved to a house. You say, no, wait a minute. How, 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 do you, how do you know that? Because the Word of God tells us in the book of Matthew, when, when, the, uh, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the wise men came, uh, that they found him in a house. That's Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, if you want to... Check, check that out. So he wasn't in a manger. He wasn't in a stable. He was in a house. We also, as we read through this, we see some other events have transpired in the life of this little baby Jesus, this God man, this, uh, this deity uh, wrapped in human flesh, born to a virgin in Bethlehem's manger. We'll see, and I'll just give it to you, and you can note it as I read it in a moment. That after eight days, he, he was given the official name of Jesus and uh, underwent uh, 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 the, the procedure of circumcision, which was common for the Jewish boys. We also notice as we read in the text that something else happens, that some 40 days after his birth, he is then carried to the temple. Now, that was done in accordance with the Jewish law of Leviticus, where that after a woman gave birth, and especially a male, she was to go, to go and, and offer a sacrifice. And a sacrifice was to be offered uh, um, as a matter of, of purification for her after bearing a child. It is there that we, we come to the, uh, to the introduction to this man, Simeon. 
Now notice with me as I read the verses and you can see what I have just rehearsed for you as it is written in the word of God. Notice verse uh, number 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the, chi of the child, his name was called Jesus because it was at the, at the time of circumcision that the, official, that the official name was given to the baby boy, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, that was 40 days after the birth, according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. In other words, they left Bethlehem, traveled six miles to Jerusalem, and there to the temple to make the sacrifice in fulfillment of the Mosaic law as written in the book of, of, of Leviticus. And the Bible says, and as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. That may seem to be an insignificant statement, but it tells us something about Mary and Joseph. Because the sacrifice that was required or requested in the book of Leviticus was a ram. And then maybe a pigeon or a turtle dove. But to the poor people who could not afford the ram, could not afford, uh, did not have access, they were allowed to bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. When we see this, it denotes the fact uh, that, that Mary and Joseph were of, of, of a poor class and they did not have a lot of money. I don't know about you, that kind of that makes me feel good, that God can use poor folk. Isn't that something? And I've noticed something in my ministry. I've noticed that it is the poor folk often that God anoints and gives special callings and, and uses them in unusual ways. Now, he, yes, he uses, he uses the elite and uses the, uh, those that have wealth and all. But I have found that more than oft, he, he finds the, uh, a way to use those that in the eyes of the world may not have the most to offer as far as intellectual or, or materialism. And so it was when Mary and Joseph, they came, they brought the turtle doves and the pigeons, uh, or two young pigeons. And when they came, notice what happens. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout. But that tells us about his character. He was a godly man, just, had been justified, devout. Well, he lived a sanctified life. He was holy. He was a, a good man. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the fulfillment of a promise. He was waiting for that time when Messiah would come. That's what that literally means. Then you notice what he says. <clears throat> it says about him, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Then notice in verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, Revealed that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wow, what a great promise. Here's now a promise given to an individual. To Simeon, the promise is given by the Spirit of God that he would not die until he had seen the Christ uh, uh, Lord or the Lord's Christ. Then notice in verse 27, and he came by the Spirit to the temple. Spirit of God led him to come to the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law to offer the, the, the sacrifices, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. You see those words, depart in peace, it's not in my notes, but it is in my, from my study. Let me throw it in there to you. Those words, I am told from the Greek, are actually military terms. And what it was, what, what they were, the military terms was used at the time of the completion of a battle, the completion of, a, of an engagement, and they, and they were to leave in peace. In other words, they, they had finished the task. They had finished the engagement. They could now go home. They, all that they had been sent to do had been accomplished. And here is Simeon who has said, all right, my, my, the, the one thing of, that was keeping me alive has been finished. I have seen, uh, the, the, I have seen the, <coughs> the Lord's Christ 
And so now I am ready to depart in peace according to thy word. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set before <coughs> before the uh, is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel for a sign which shall be spoken again, uh, spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Thus we have the introduction to this man, Simeon. Let me give you quickly a, an outline of, to help you remember what I'm, what I'm about to share with you. First of all, we see God's promise to, to Simeon. He should not see death before he has seen the Lord's Christ. No time had been given Simeon. I have heard people say that Simeon went to the temple every day. Well, he may have, but if he did, it's not recorded in the scriptures. I don't know how often he went, but I do know that he went on that day that Jesus came, led by the Holy Spirit of God to be there when the Christ child came. No definite time was given him. No doubt he had waited for some time. No doubt he had wondered, will it ever happen? No doubt he was concerned, I'm getting older. Then I want you to notice, secondly, the truth of what God has spoken to Simeon was fulfilled. God said, you're not going to die until you see the Lord's Christ. And it happened just the way the Lord said. There was a promise given to Simeon. Secondly, I want you to notice the perception of Simeon. Simeon knew who he saw when he saw this child. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Simeon knew this baby was the Christ. He was to be, this baby was to be the Savior, according to verse 34. And Mary was to suffer a broken heart because of what was going to transpire in the life of this baby. We know that was in reference to the fact that when he was crucified for your sin and for mine some 33 years later. Then I want you to notice the picture that's depicted by Simeon. And this is the sermon for us on this Christmas, on this Christmas, on this New Year's Eve. This is the, the picture. This is uh, the application, if you please, for you and me. There is a promise that is given not just to Simeon, there's a promise that's given to us. <clears throat> Jesus gave it in John chapter 14, verses one through three. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Then he gave us the promise. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what? I will come again. You know, I've often thought, we celebrate Christmas and as on December the 25th, whether that be the day or not, I question, but it doesn't really matter. It's the day that we've set aside to acknowledge the birth of the Savior. <coughs> and, uh, but you wonder, from, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, called the Proto-Evangelium, the first mention of the virgin birth, to Isaiah's prophet of, cha of chapter 7, verse 14, and, and that a virgin shall conceive. And all the years it transpired, how many people would have said, you know, I've heard all my life about this Messiah coming here. Yeah, I don't know. You know, uh, it's been, I've, I've heard it all my life. Never. And then I, my grandpa heard all about it. You know what? I wonder if there were people who doubted. And I would suggest to you that God has given us a promise, I will come again. And I've been hearing that all my life. He hasn't come yet. And, I'm, and my granddaddy, Holland, God love his soul, I never will forget <clears throat> one day he was talking to me. I had just received the Lord and gone away to school. <clears throat> I a call to preach and we were talking. And he said, you know, son, I don't think I'm ever going to die. I said, Pa, what do you mean you're never going to die? It's a point that the man wants to die. He said, no, I believe the Lord's going to come before I die. Well, sad to say he was mistaken. He died. 
I wonder if I'll ever die. I wonder if you'll ever die. You say, well, why, why, why would you say that? All, all of us are going to die. No, 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 no. See, God gave a promise. He said, I am going to come. I don't know when he's going to come. Did you know if he comes before 12 o'clock tonight, he would have come in the year 2017? Did you know that we ought to live every day of our life in 2018 with an anticipation that this could be the year that the Lord comes? Why would you say that, preacher? Because he gave us a promise. You know, we, uh, our little boy had a very limited vocabulary. And, uh, but, uh, but even as a child, before his brain tumor, whenever we would make a promise to go by and get him a McDonald's or whatever, he had, he had, he'd always make this comment back to us. Now, Dad, you know a promise is a promise. You know, a promise is a promise. And this morning I stand and gaze into the heavens. No, I can't see the eyes of the Savior, and I can't, certainly can't see the, see, see the heavenly Father. But I want to say to him, a promise is a promise. You said you're going to come. And one day he's going to come. Just like he came to that temple and Simeon saw him. Before he died, so shall Jesus one day come. I don't know when he's going to come. I tell people, if you want to know when the Lord's going to come, you'll have to check those TV preachers out. I, they know. I don't have a clue. But I do know he's going to come because he promised to come. You see, I will come again. He also reiterates that, that promise and in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. The apostle Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica. They were concerned about people who had died. Well, what happens to them? What about the coming of, what about the resurrection? He had all kinds of questions about the matter. So Paul sort of sums it up in the fourth chapter in verses 13 and following. And he said, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. I love that term, ignorant brethren. I was honored to, as a, as, um, the brother, brother Duncan mentioned I was at Tennessee Temple. I heard, heard some great preachers out there. I heard Warren Wearsby on several occasions. One time he was preaching through the book of First Thessalonians, and as he was, he got the distext, and he said, I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He stopped and looked up. He said, the ignorant brethren. He said, that's the largest denomination in the world. <laughs> I have learned that, that he was a wise man, so true, the ignorant brethren. But here the Apostle Paul said, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren. Ignorant about what? Concerning them which have died or asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, literally precede, them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Those two words is where we get the word rapture, by the way. You hear some people say sometimes, well, you, got, you, you, you fundamentalists talk about the rapture. The word rapture is not even in the Bible. No, it's not. Neither is the word trinity, but I still believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the word called up literally means to be raptured, to be caught away, to be caught up. And he says you shall be caught up together with them, those that have been resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, in light of these things, comfort one another with these words. There are three things about the promise of the coming of the Lord. First of all, there's the promise of the resurrection. There's the promise of a resurrection. My wife and I just got back from North Carolina where I pastored for 16 years where our son passed away, where his body was laid to rest in a cemetery out in front of the church that I pastored. There's a grave there. There's a tombstone there. Listen to me, old liberal. Listen to me, old humanist. Don't you take away the hope of the resurrection. And there, and, and, and there, is, there is a promise of a resurrection, isn't it? 
And every one of us who said goodbye to a loved one, whether it was in the last year or years gone by, thank God for the promise one day there's going to be a resurrection. The resurrection. There's a promise of a, there's a, promise of a rapture. Caught up. If Jesus comes today in fulfillment of that, of that promise that he made that I will come again, the dead in Christ will rise first. We that are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up. That's raptured. Yes, to meet the Lord in the air, but there's also going to be a reunion because we're going to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, this is the last day of 2017. Wouldn't it be a glorious thing if the promise was fulfilled today and our Lord would come? And those we've said goodbye to who died in Christ would be raised from the dead and we which are alive and remain will be caught up and together we would meet the Lord in the air and so should we, should we ever be with the Lord. What a wonderful thought. The promise. God said it. And if God said it, he'll do it. And just like he came to Bethlehem's manger, has it been prophesied in Genesis 3 and Isaiah 7 and, in, and, then in, and then in Micah chapter 2, the very exact place and many other Old Testament passages, so shall he come again. Just as he had said to Simeon, you'll not die until you have seen the Lord's Christ. And he fulfilled the promise, so shall he come and fulfill the promise. Hey, what I'm trying to tell you today is very, 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 very profound. Jesus is coming. And he may come today. What a wonderful thought. His coming. The promise of his coming. There should be a persistence of our anticipation. He's coming. Let me give you some things about his coming. Just in passing, I don't have time to, to speak on them. His coming is instantaneous. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Apostle Paul said, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, you know, when I was a little boy, I attended a church, and the pastor was a good man, believed the Bible, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. He was free will Baptist. Ronald Creech was his name. And he preached often on the second coming. And I was just a little fellow, six, seven, eight years old. And I used to hear him. I knew I wasn't a Christian. I knew I'd never asked Jesus into my life. I didn't get saved until I was 18. But I used to think about, he keeps talking about this Jesus coming in the air. And all the dead being raised that were saved. And all the Christians being called up. But there's going to be a trumpet. And what I'm going to do is if I hear that trumpet, I'm going to fall on my knees right then and invite Jesus into my life. You say, that's foolish. That's no more foolish than maybe some of you who know that if you were to die today, you wouldn't go to heaven and live every day with the reality that this could be the day Jesus comes and your opportunity would be gone. His coming is instantaneous. In a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, his coming is imminent. You say, oh, that means soon. No. Imminent means at any moment. At any time. Could be soon. Could be later. Like I told you before, I don't know when he's coming, but he's coming because he promised to come. His coming is important. It's important for the saints because we'll be with Jesus. We'll be free from this whole, whole world and this whole sinful flesh and be with the Lord. It's important because we'll be reunited with those who've gone on before us. It's important. It's coming. It's important for the saints, but it's also important for the unbelievers. According to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11, and 12. If you've heard the gospel, and if you haven't heard, let me give it to you now so you can hear. Jesus came, was born of a virgin, lived 33 years, went to a Roman cross, died, reached back to the sin of Adam and reached forward to the sin of the last man, woman, boy, or girl to ever be born some way, somehow. Theologians have tried but can't explain it. 
gathered the sin of every man, woman, boy, and girl and bore our sins in his own body while he hung on that cross, was taken from that cross and laid in a tomb and the third day was raised from the dead, showed himself for 40 days and then was ascended to the right hand of the Father and has promised he's coming again. He's coming back. And to anyone who's willing to receive what he's done on the cross as the payment for their sin, by faith, trust what he did. Repent of your sin and receive him. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if he comes, you're going to be caught up. And if you die, you're going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's the gospel. Now you've heard it. You're unsaved. You walk through those doors and walk out. Life comes to a close or the promise is fulfilled and Jesus comes. Your destiny is determined because the, Paul says to those in Thessalonians, you'll believe a lie and be damned. No hope. No hope. To the sinner, it's important that you understand he made a promise. He's coming back. Simeon, I want to give you a promise, the Holy Spirit says to him. The promise is you'll not die until you see the Lord's Christ. And one day, Simeon, led by the Spirit of God, goes to the temple and laid in his arms as a baby. And he said, this is it. He's the one. And God kept his promise. And the Lord says to you and I, I'm coming back. I will come again. And one day, he'll come back. My question to you today, if he were to come on this last day of 2017, are you ready to meet him? Would you be called up to meet him in the air? Let me give you another question a little more direct. You say, oh yeah, I'm saved. If he comes, I'm going to be caught up. Would you like for him to come today? You know, there's an old, 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 old country hymn, not hymn, gospel song that the old folks used to sing years ago. Wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. You know that song? You say, that's not scriptural. Well, I know that, but I but they used to sing it anyway. But there's a lot of believers that are saying, Jesus, could you wait a little longer? I got a few things I need to get right. Huh? You hear what I'm saying to you? What about your life? Do you really want him to come? You know, there's a crown of righteousness promised to all those who love his appearing. Are you loving the reality that he could come today? Do you love the fact that he may return? You see, God always does what he says. And he said, I will come again. It may be today. If not today, should we not awaken every morning in the year 2018 with an anticipation in our hearts that this could be the day? Jesus could come in 2018. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Or even 2017. For it is not ended. But remember this old preacher told you. He's coming again. How do you know that? Because he promised. And a promise is a promise. Especially when it comes from a sovereign God. Shall we pray? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I do not know what your custom is here, but if you'll indulge me for the morning. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't know if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. I'd like to invite you to come to know Christ today. This may be your last opportunity. Why, you think I'm going to die? Well, I don't know, you might, but if you don't, he could come. He could come 
today. He could come tomorrow. He promised, I will come again. And if you do not know him as your Savior, would you not trust him today? Would you not acknowledge that you're a sinner? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Would you not recognize him as the only sacrifice for sin? I know you died on the cross for, my, for me, Lord. Would you not receive him by simple faith, Lord? I want you to come into my life. I want you to forgive me of my sin. I, I repent of my wrong, my sin, and invite you to be my Savior. And if you do that, we'd love to rejoice with you in your decision. We'd like to help you understand better. In a few moments, we'd like to invite you to step out and come. And I'll meet you down front, and then some of the other the deacons and some of the other leadership can be here and help you. But I'd invite you to come. And Christian, what about you? Maybe you don't need anyone to pray with you. You just need to pray. Maybe it's to pray for others, or maybe it's to pray for yourself. Maybe it's just to thank God for the promise. I will come again. But whatever your need might be, I invite you to come. Maybe kneel around the altar. If you say, I can't kneel, then sit on the front seats. That's fine. Or maybe right where you are. Heavenly Father, to the best of my ability, Lord, I've tried to share the message on Simeon. A man who was just and devout, but a man who had a promise in his life, and he held to the promise. And Lord, I pray we'd hold to the promise. May we be just, may we be devout, but may we hold to the promise. Jesus is coming. Father, I pray that you'll speak to hearts. Thank you for our time together. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? The piano's going to begin to play, and we'll ask to our song leader to come in just a moment and lead us in whatever the invitation hymn that he has chosen. But as the instruments play him, if God's spoken to you, you don't know Christ as your Savior and you'd like to meet him, would you step out and come? I invite you to do it right now. Will you do it? Come on. Anyone? Christian, you need to come. I invite you to come. 